Hi there. Welcome tonight to this edition of The Devil's Advocate. And I just want to tell you that tonight's show is brought to you by... Can you read that? This is Clay Smith's All You Know Is What You Think You Know. A great little read that is filled with wisdom and uh, self-discovery. That's a good way of putting it. And to everyone out there, you too can sponsor a show of The Devil's Advocate for $5 an episode. And uh, give us your, your graphics or your video or whatever you want us to show. And we will show it during our show. Thank you very much. And tonight... Our special guest is Thomas Fusco, a good friend of mine, uh, a paranormal troublemaker, and uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the author of Beyond the Cosmic ba Veil. Did I get that right? It's Behind the Cosmic Veil. Behind the Cosmic Veil. There we go. Sorry. I, I, I can't have a show without screwing something up, so... Um, and Tom has a very interesting theory that's called super geometry. And while we normally have Tom on and talk about his book, tonight we're going to be a little different because we're going to talk beyond the book. We're going to talk about what direction that we want to head into because Tom and I are sharing research data with each other in the hopes of coming to the truth. How you doing tonight, Tom? Oh, not too bad, man. Uh, just... Uh trying to get it all done and uh, uh, not not enough hours in a day or not enough days in a week. Just remember, fishing is for people who can't work. <laughs> or who won't work. Won't yeah, there you go. There you go. I used to like to say work was for people who can't fish. but uh, <laughs> I like I seem, that one, too. I, I seem to be breaking that rule quite often these days, so. So we were having a discussion, actually, the other night, which I thought was rather interesting. We started to discuss uh, potential for a future movement with what we're doing. And you've been talking with several people, and there are people who have expressed an interest in maybe getting on board of our thunder. So let, let's talk a little bit about that. Well, as you know, David, one of the most critical things that we need to do is to be able to uh, find competent people that are going to uh, make efforts to kind of duplicate your work because we've talked before about how important that is. Right. And um, <clears throat> I've been gaining some, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been gaining some converts uh, to this way that you and I want to uh, uh, dissect this paranormal uh, puzzle, so to speak, uh, where I've been helping them to see that the old way just isn't getting us anywhere. And we've taken that about as far as we can. And if we're serious about moving this research to the next level, uh, that we have to do it in a scientific way. And... Right. We need the uh, um, uh, not only the uh, the technical aspects of it, uh, but the ability to understand how to set up a scientifically uh, valid uh, uh, testing conditions out in the field, and of course with the theoretical framework that gives us that roadmap, uh, so that we're not just out there uh, trying to pick up piles of data. Uh, with no structure in which to plug them. So, uh, you know, we are making progress, obviously, and uh, I'm very encouraged that we're very close uh, to uh, really making some significant progress in that next level that you and I want to go to. I, I agree, and uh, we're being joined by my co-host, yay, Stephen Rourke. Uh, Dr. Rourke, are you not feeding us video for a reason? Correct. <laughs> okay, so the doc is in his jockey shorts. All right, so, so uh, tonight, uh, Stephen, we're talking with Thomas Fusco, and we are discussing directions from here. Oh, uh, sure. Tom recently went to a, what do you call that, a symposium, I guess, right? 
It is the Paradigm Symposium. Uh, it is the, uh, uh, this is the third year that it's been held. Uh, it's kind of unusual because the underlying theme of this event is the uh, goal of bridging mainstream and alternative studies. And that's kind of different because most of these uh, uh, symposiums or conferences uh, revolve around a particular uh, theme or subject. And then they bring all the gurus in on, you know, on that particular uh, subject, whatever that is. Uh, This uh, uh, addresses a number of different subjects, but the idea is to uh, bridge that mainstream with alternative and find that common ground. Yeah, it's it's kind of a multidisciplined symposium in many ways, which... I think is a very healthy thing because these subjects that are what have been labeled fringe science uh, are actually multidiscipline studies. Um, there's no one college discipline that really prepares you for it. You really have to have a mix of skill sets for a variety of these these subject matters. Oh yeah, in part project manager, as you found out, David, <laughs> you're kind of a part-time project manager, full-time physicist, interfacing with part-time psychologists and armchair uh, anthropologists. All, all the way to, I mean, biomedical people, uh, neurologists. You know, I mean, we, we touch base with a lot of different disciplines across the spectrum because there are so many different types of phenomena that we deal with. Okay. So... So, and while you were at the symposium, Tom, you, uh, of course, won hearts and minds because you were dealing with intellectual people. Well, yeah, David, uh, that's another thing that's unusual about this event in that uh, it does draw a little bit <clears throat> more of a sophisticated and affluent uh, crowd. Uh, it's, it costs a little bit of money to get a ticket for this one. So you, you get a higher caliber of people there, and, and so uh, you can really kind of get through to them with, uh, uh, you know, with, with a, uh, you know, a, a higher caliber uh, message. So I'm already getting feedback from the teasers from the new TV show, Ghost Stalkers, and much of the teasers are reflective of the intellect of those who are critiquing it, I should say. Uh-oh. Uh, we actually had an article appear in the New York Times, and it was pretty obvious with reading the article that the guy, he's a journalist. I mean, and, and that's fine. Uh, I think it's great that we actually got into the New York Times. And um, he was very dubious of the EMF quadrilator, primarily because it was called the wormhole detector in the show. Um, which in many ways it it may be, um, but it's a whole lot flowing, you know, to say it's a wormhole detector than to say, oh, that's the EMF quadrilator. Because, <laughs> it's more, you know, it's more sensational too. Well, it, it's about entertainment. It's about TV, and everyone needs to understand that there are aspects about TV that you have to comply with, and we have to make it entertaining. Number one, um, so we could call it whatever. We want to call it. The idea is is that it's looking for emerging information, and that emerging information has no visible or detectable source, which is also very important. And and in doing this, I think um, a lot of it has to do with people don't understand it. They don't understand the technology behind it. They don't think you can buy this off the shelf, and and the equipment, the actual hardware, you actually can buy off the shelf. The secret is is the programming of it and the way that it's arranged as an apparatus, as a prototypical device. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear, number one. But having said all that, the paranormal community is agog about it because they are seeing EMF. They are watching on TV and they are seeing EMF that before it was just you know a few little numbers on a little meter that really didn't tell them a whole lot. Now they're seeing what it looks like, and I am so grateful for the opportunity 
to have this show uh, have me on it because it's allowing me to demonstrate exactly that. It's allowing me to show real data and putting that data into context. Now, consequently, you have been talking with, I don't know if you want to mention any names, but you've been talking with an individual who is interested in duplicating some of the work. Oh, yeah, and I don't think he would have uh, uh, any any uh, problem with that. The uh, individual is Barry Fitzgerald. Uh, we know him from uh, Ghost Hunters International, that TV series. And he was one of the speakers at Paradigm Symposium, and he kind of surprised me because I didn't really know what kind of material he was going to present. I thought it was going to be the typical, you know, ghost hunter kind of thing. Right. Uh, but what he was talking about was research into uh, some mystery uh, places that exist up there in uh, Ireland where he comes from. And so it was quite it was quite fascinating. I was quite happy to see that he was talking about something else uh, than the usual table fair. And then he heard my presentation. And I did talk uh, somewhat about paranormal phenomena and, and the theory of supergeometry. And uh, after the uh, presentation, he came up to me later and said, Tom, he said, you blew my mind. So you changed the way that I look at a lot of different things in the field. And so we started uh, pretty much talking a lot about your work, David. Uh, once he understood that there was, he really did get this roadmap of, of my theoretical work. But he was quite fascinated with what you were doing and expressed a very, very keen interest in learning about uh, several different things and learning about the uh, the quadrilator, uh, learning from you how to set up a, uh, a laboratory uh, condition in the field that is scientifically uh, significant and, and uh, emeritus. And he was also very, very interested in the various kinds of uh, uh, frequencies that you've been detecting that are associated with certain uh, emergent phenomena. Right. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, I mean, he came to me later that night uh, at the hotel uh, in the lobby, and he said, Tommy, he says, I just got done uh, publicizing your name all over Europe. So that's a big, that's a big shot in the arm for us. And uh, mm -hmm. he wants, as you know, David, he wants to get together with uh, you and I. We're going to, set up something that we can get together and conference on Skype. And uh, uh, he's very, he's very uh, uh, excited about getting this rolling. That's good. That's good. My hearts and minds, one at a time. That's what we have to do here. Um, Stephen, you're being awful quiet. Well, I was actually listening quite excited for you, David. That is wonderful. The uh, opportunity for some of these folks, I think, to finally see this uh, EMF EVP connection, you know, battling against the insistence that, well, I don't know if it's an insistence so much it is like a persisting myth of it being audio. Well, you mentioned on some occasion it is audio. It's, you know, it can differ, but... Well, there's still. two types of phenomena. There's audible voice phenomena and there's electronic voice phenomena, and they are two different types of energy. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard something hysterical, and I'll let you go ahead when I finish this because it's just an interjection point. I was watching a show on TV the other night, and I'm not going to mention any names or anything, but uh, one of the statements that one of the investigators made was, do you hear that? I can hear the infrasound. Ah! <laughs> what, what, what exactly is that? Yeah, that's, that was my question. <laughs> I well, don't think said you... I can feel the infrasound. And my yeah. Body... <laughs> or, or it's, you know, my emotions are being triggered by infrasound, or I have to go to the bathroom because of infrasound. I mean, I can understand that. But to uh, hear the infrasound, it's like, it's the old quote from, you know, the Princess Bride, you know, I don't think that word means what you think it means. You yeah. Do <laughs> you think brilliant. Kmart shoppers? Yeah. I mean, this is a problem, an ongoing problem in the field is terminology. Um, and it's one that's kind of frustrating when you're watching it because people are, 
you know, millions of people are listening to incorrect information. Mm. And it's part of that whole meme, Stephen, that you and I just have discussed and beat till the bones were bared from the flesh <laughs> of these rep repetitive notions that are perpetrated and then regenerated, you know, ad nauseum until they become a reality for people. Oh, yeah. And, and in fact, they're not reality at all. They are incorrect. And, and you know, it's very difficult overcoming that mindset when you've got people that have been doing something a certain way for 10 years and thinking that that's the gospel, that's the only way to do this, and then trying to explain to them that that's not exactly what's going on, you know. Um, but go ahead, finish your finish what you were saying. Oh, no, no. I always, in fact, I... Uh... <laughs> I often defer to my wiser counsel. I'm the fool on the hill who will sit there, you know, lecturing about how what you need is discipline inquiry and you all need a, <laughs> you all need a lecture on formal logic. And, you know, but that, it really never gets anywhere. You're doing yeah. it much more brightly. This is a much better way to go about it, this business of uh, hearts and minds one at a time. I, I, don't, I don't know. You must have... You must be an old soul or something. I, I really don't suffer fools as gladly. But um, anyway, I get what you're – I mean that makes perfect sense. You And the reason is, and I appreciate why you put an emphasis on this hearts and minds one at a time thing and why it's about personal connections, which I didn't really get until we began interacting on this mission to the extent we had. The fact is that if we want a critical mass to – envelope this subject of interest, this area of inquiry, so it can ultimately be elevated to a discipline, you really do need the level of interest because post-secondary education is a business. It so, is a business. you know, there has to be that mass appeal. You can't just have some, this, some arcane freaking subject no one wants to know about and think you're going to appeal to academia with any uh, persuasion. So, the reality is it does have to be this multi-phased approach like you take, where it's hearts, minds, and at the very core of it, you take a discipline inquiry approach so you can talk to the eggheads the way they need to be talked to. Exactly. You still have to keep your humanity, though. You've got to keep your blue collar on so that the troops in the field get it because we need numbers. And we can teach those people how to do simple experiments that will bring us data in numbers and and those are the kind of things we need and and it's like I always say you know you don't have to be a rocket scientist to make a huge discovery in science you just have to be in the right place at the right time doing the right thing and uh, understanding you have something that needs to be looked at by someone who may have a greater understanding of it than you do and being open right. to doing that and and that's kind of the overall message that I do with that but having said all that go ahead Tom oh I uh what I wanted to add, you know, and I mean, we've beaten this horse to death also, but uh, the reality is, is that the vast majority of the paranormal community doesn't have any interest in this at all because it's not part of what they're looking for. It's not part of their goal. Uh, you know, there's lots of different motivations in this field, and there's only a very, very small percentage that is actually genuinely interested in advancing our scientific understanding, not only about what's happening, but its implications to our understanding about the way everything in reality is put together. Uh, most people are very satisfied with the trophy hunting and, you know, helping the poor folks uh, get the ghost out of their house and, and, and these kinds of things. But do they really do that? See, that's the thing. No. Are they really removing the phenomena? No, they're not. No. And, and that's the thing. You know, there's a certain amount of disingenuousness in it. And, I mean, I'm hoping that by presenting an example publicly that I can change the mindset. Because, see, what we're doing is outside the meme. And anytime you're outside the meme, you're the target of criticism. And that's okay. Um, I like criticism and I like public criticism in which I have a chance to respond publicly to it. 
because I can then provide the data to prove my point verbally in response to the criticism. And generally, it does one or two things. It either makes a person go out and buy a gun and hunt you down for the rest of your life, <laughs> or, or it makes them think. And when it makes them think, they start thinking outside of that meme. And that's what we have to do. We have to kind of, you know, like beckon them to, to get out of that meme, you know, and kind of be kind of open to these other things that are out here that we can demonstrate. And the ability to physically, visually demonstrate these things is a huge tool in fighting that battle. And that's why I'm very, very, very happy that I'm in the situation I'm in right now because I can visually present this stuff to stimulate that line of thought. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm so looking forward to the show. And, and let me tell you, it's got drama. It's got psychology. I mean, they put these guys by themselves in the dark in, in a location that has activity going on. And it's not, did you hear that? Did you hear that? You hear the stuff happening and you see them responding to it as they respond to it. So there's a tremendous amount of psychological factor involved in this. There's a tremendous amount of humanity involved in it. And there's points where some sometimes they are really scared. They are really dealing with something they can't categorize. And that, to me, is the best kind of drama to have in a paranormal TV show, is the genuine, real phenomena that you encounter when you do this stuff for a living. I still think it would be amazing if someone had taken you up on your protocol for a show that would take a no BS, no Bravo Sierra approach, one that would use that protocol you had of throat mics on all participants, even the ability to do some sort of uh, overhead map with an accounting of individuals and where they are in the structure, uh, real time, uh, almost doing like a second screen approach that people could pull up a, uh, an app, a little map, and show where everyone is and tune in on their specific throat mics to show and go back and re repeat the evidence, review the evidence in a data log fashion to show that there was absolutely no fakery, uh, because that's right. always now in the back of people's minds now that the other shows have poisoned the well. That's Anytime someone gets right. amazing evidence, unfortunately, that's in the back of people's minds. Well, we'll never be able to do that, at least at this stage of the game, but it's my hope that down the road that may become a reality. But this is what we are doing. Uh, we are starting to play around with biometrics. Um, in one episode, I use them to monitor different aspects of each member. Ah. So we're touching on it. Remember, it's a first season. We only shot six episodes. We can't cram everything into one season. So I'm introducing the concept of monitoring the monitors. Good, good. And so that will be in the first season, the introduction of that. And where it goes from there will, will remains to be seen. Um, now, back to Tom and I, our, our never-ending argument as, is to what is the source. Um, we've come to a conclusion that it's going to be very difficult monetarily right now as well as theoretically right now to prove his source point mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's going to be impossible it's just going to take some very elaborate expensive equipment to even look for it however we can prove or disprove my source point still expensively but a much less cheaper than where we would have to go for some of the specialty equipment we would need to look for his so what Tom is going to do, and this is going to thrill you because you've, you've had the same comment about it as I had, Tom's going to put his theory in, in a theoretical paper format. Instead of reading his book and, and, and digesting it that way, he's going to, to bullet it. He's going to bullet point it. And that makes it a research document. Oh, and yeah. that means we can go onto that document and we can pick a bullet point and design an experiment around that bullet point. Now, I have no issue with that because most of his bullet points are the same as mine, and that's mm -hmm. the beauty of it. 
Um, where we're going to part the hairs is where we get to the emergence point, where that interface occurs. You know, what is that interface? And that's what we need to identify because if we can identify it, then Tom and I, we can, we can reconcile our two theories into one theory. Well, and that I, oh, is go the ahead. goal to have one unified theory. Now, my theory only takes a little piece of the pie. Tom's theory is a much more grander in scope theory. Go ahead, Tom. All right. Um, I think what we're dealing with, and and I had mentioned this before, uh, is that. <laughs> Right now, in our understanding of reality, science deals in materialism. That's the fundamental paradigm, that reality is what is physical, and what is physical is what is reality. And there's nothing outside of that. Uh, this gives us a what I call a two-state model of reality, where we're looking at a quantum state and a relativistic state. And we just simply cannot reconcile them. And attempts to do so seem to create as many anomalies and paradoxes as it tries to solve. Uh, string theory is a very good example of that. Uh, now, it's understandable because uh, science is dealing with exactly what you were just talking about, David, which is being able to experimentally test something. Well... If we have a third state of reality that isn't physical, how do you test it? There really is no way of observing and measuring it. Uh, so consequently, and again, to expand on what I was saying just a minute ago, uh, the super geometric model uh, accepts a three-state model of reality, which is uh, non-physical, or what I call super geometric uh, you could call it super physical. Uh, David Bohm called it implicate order. Uh, you know, uh, Finkelstein called it coherent superpositions. These are things that are not really physical, but that they emerge as physical reality. So when we have a three-state uh, model of reality, which is super geometric, bottom, and relativistic, this gives us a completely new concept in which to approach it. Uh, so if we have non-physical on one side and fully physical or relativistic on the other side, we now then can look at the quantum state and see it as a transitional state between non-physical to fully physical. Now, just thinking about that for a moment, conceptually, that opens all kinds of possibilities that were not even conceivable because of the way we looked at it previously. It would explain a lot of the funky things that go on on a quantum level. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make is this. When we're dealing with something that we cannot uh, uh, directly measure, as with this super geometric model, what we can do, we can go as far as having a theoretical model that answers the most number of questions posed to it in a consistent way. And then if that model can make predictions that are experimentally verifiable in the physical, we have a good working theory. We don't necessarily have to detect the source directly, so to speak. No, we can detect the effects of the source. And, and that's why studying the interface is so important. And my whole paradigm shifted eight years ago when I started pursuing the relativistic application of the Einstein-Rosen bridge being the responsible factor in this because what I had to do is to take something that's an accepted theory already and work within the bounds of that to get any kind of grease on it, you know, to get anything going. And, and really there's no reason in the world why a wormhole wouldn't exist or why an Einstein-Rosen bridge wouldn't exist because it's actually part of a working proven theory called relativity. Um, yeah, what was entertaining to me recently in the news, they announced that uh, this woman in in North Carolina said that there was no such thing as a wormhole. 
Now, I find that pretty myopic in the fact that astronomers have observed them. <laughs> you know, so, and, and we, there was just a follow-up article yesterday, I think it was. I think we're talking about black holes, right? They were talking about black holes, the yeah. emergence of black holes. But the, see, the dynamic of a wormhole and a black hole is a wormhole is just a much scaled down version of the concept of a black hole because it still has gravity fluctuations, but it doesn't have a gravity well associated with a black hole. Now, they, they detected very brilliant radiation and it wasn't coming from a black hole. So now they are speculating that there could be multiple sources for Hawking radiation because a black hole can't emit. A black hole has a limit of right. the light that it, can, that it can emit. And this was exceeding that limit so that this black hole had to be humongous. I mean, absolutely humongous to be doing this. Mm. So now, they're, they're, now they're, they're all looking at each other saying there's something else. There's something else. Even though they've associated wormholes with a certain amount of this, there is a super type of wormhole radiation that isn't coming from a detectable wormhole at all, but from something else. Yeah. And and I believe that something else is the localized bending of time space in a very large area, an anomaly, so to speak. Yeah. So yeah. so, you know, again. These are grists for the mill, so to speak. Um, I, I, it took me two days to stop laughing over the wormholes doesn't exist thing because I have two friends that are astrophysicists and one's an astronomer, and they have mapped and documented dual orbiting wormholes in just about every galaxy we can visually see. Mm -hmm. And they've done this by documenting star movement adjacent to these wormholes. And the stars are moving extremely rapidly and erratically indicating a vortexual type mass that's in the darkness in the center. So they didn't, what this little theory did is they proved something in math that has physical evidence that doesn't support it. And it kind of brings me back to uh, Dr. David Deutsch's uh, math proving of the many worlds theory uh, that Hugh Everett III came up with. Which I also have a problem with because if every time we make a decision we create another universe, where's all this energy coming from creating these universes? It's crazy. It's every just... person would have millions of universes during their lifetime they created. And there's where's that energy coming from? I mean, talk about violating, you know, the, the laws of thermodynamics. You know, it's just you 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 just can't you can't buy into that. But math can prove it. So we have to be careful about what math proves. I believe we have to have some type of foundation to work our math off of. Oh, yeah, not conceptual just a, foundation, yeah. Yeah, not just the speculative crunching numbers and making them fit into whatever reality or feathery realm you want to create. We, we, we have to have some type of direction to look at. Now, I read her paper, and, you know, I get what she was doing, um, and it's probably why it wasn't published in a physics journal. It was published in a, a non-associated peer-reviewed type journal. Yeah. A pay-as-you-go uh, journal. Yeah, yeah. So uh, my, my idea is, is that you know, no one's going to buy into it. And, of course, no one did. Um, primarily because it was myopic in its approach. It, it zeroed in on a specific thing and then ignored all these other things that are a byproduct of the specific thing. And we can't afford to do that with what we're doing. We can't ignore anything. Um, what we're looking at is so important, and it's so fundamentally earth-shattering that we can't afford to overlook anything. We can't afford to assume anything. We've got to let our data draw our conclusions and fuel our conclusions. Um, and that's why I haven't openly said wormholes are real. You know, even though right now I'm about... 90% sure that wormholes are very real and that we're probably documenting uh, evidence of that. But I'm not ready to go out on the limb and say for sure that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. Because there's that 10% that's nagging that's left that has to be fleshed out. So, and, it, and it's in the same boat. And, and the thing that I find so unique about your theory and my theory is that they are not in conflict with one another. 
no. data wise. The data is pretty consistent as it would be regardless of what the source was. So right up until the interface, we're in total agreement. And that's huge because I came to my conclusion independently of you. I did mine with field demonstrative research. You did yours with armchair theoreticism, you know, and they merge all the way up to the emergence point of the information. Stephen? Yes, incredible. I mean, we're seeing an example of really parallel research. Uh, these are things we so rarely see in science, frankly, that uh, it, it truly is a unique event. I mean, you have it occasionally in art, which almost shows this this common theme in humanity of the hundredth monkey syndrome, you know, where two artists separated by culture and geography will simultaneously begin painting in, you know, a bizarre uh, new way like cubism or something. That's right. I mean, that's wild enough. But when you come down to the theoretical foundations, the commonalities that you're independently arrived at theories share. I mean, it's just, frankly, I don't know if it's, you know, I'm not really one that goes in much for this, but it might just be divine providence. I mean, who knows? It seems like we've got, we've got the, uh, the George Washington of the paranormal here in the form of David, who's willing to suffer fools and convert the masses. <laughs> I mean, it well, it's not, it's not without chopping down a few cherry trees on the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, you know, with the two of you, you guys make it seem possible is what I'm saying. Well, we think it's possible. That's why we're so excited about it because, I mean, fundamentally our first step is for Tom to outline his theory. So we have working bullet points. Um, then I can take and I can follow his bullet points and demonstrate each and every one of them using experimental you know, data. Once we get all the way to the end, to the emergence point, that's when we can sit down and finally eventually make a determination where it's either a wormhole or it's not. And if it's not, that opens up a whole new realm of so exploration. Speak. Yeah, so to speak. of exploration. <laughs> now, there's aspects about Tom's theory that I really like. I like the three levels of reality, uh, primarily because of my background in, in quantum mechanics where – you know, you have this whole thing how reality is created from pair production, how, you know, you, you take pair production and you create matter. And you're literally creating matter from energy with pair production. Now, you also have this thing called wave-particle duality, where you have, uh, it's either in an energy state or it's in a mass state. And it emphasizes the, the, the mass-energy interchangeability. So... There's something that's going on that's creating reality. Now, in quantum mechanics, we call it the observer effect, mm -hmm. whereas you know, you're know you creating your own reality to a certain degree. Well, I think that to a certain degree that's true, but we haven't fleshed out that mechanic. What is the mechanic of that? And in Tom's theory, uh, he offers an explanation for that mechanic. So... That part of it I'm very excited with. Now, you know, we're arguing fishes, you know, like brim and bass or whatever with each other. Um, but that's over the mechanic of the actual emergence. Certainly his theory is a much grander envisioning of it than mine is. Mine is rather narrowed and looking at a very specific phenomena. Um, Tom tackled a whole wealth of phenomena uh, with his theory, which makes it very powerful because he comes up with explanations for a wide variety of things. So when we look at it in that aspect, his theory is a much more than mine is. Mine is just a little basic thing where ghosts coming from kind of thing, you know? Um, whereas his kind of approach to it. So we hope that by doing this journey that we will be able to say, well, and maybe we will say this, maybe we will say, wow, wormholes are real, but there's something else going on. Mm-hmm. And I suspect that's probably where we're going to end up. I suspect we're going to find that, yes, wormholes are real, and wormholes are part of this paranormal phenomena, but there's something else involved in that interaction. What's, 
where is the source for the wormhole? Is yes. that a physical reality or is that a non-physical reality? And that's where Tom's theory comes in. Because I may be right and it's a wormhole that this stuff's emerging from, but he may be right that its source of that wormhole is non-physical. Well, let, let me uh, uh, take a few minutes to talk about some different concepts that we're, we're dealing with here <laughs> and what we're challenged with. Please um, do. Yeah. First of all, when it comes to the idea of, of the wormhole, uh, David, you and I have talked about this, and I called this emerging structure in my work a diffluential field bubble. And there was a specific reason why I used that term. Uh, however, once David, once you were talking to me about Einstein-Rosen bridges and the openings of those, when I really considered it, uh, from that point of view, uh, it made it made a lot more sense uh, in, in in this extent that from my understanding of it, an Einstein Rosen opening is a diffluential field bubble. It is. That's what I'm saying. We're, yeah. we're saying the same thing, but we're using different terminology to say it. But uh, the I difference think the visualization of the tube, the conduit. Um, kind of puts it into perspective where it's visual. It's more of a visual yeah. expression and you grasp it better. Well, I think it's even deeper than that, David. What we've got uh, with a, uh, an ER opening is that we have something that is already established with a scientifically meaningful description exactly. that ties in with uh, uh, physics as we know it today. Uh, exactly. And so that gives us something that's not only conceptually clearer, but also gives us some good foundations from which to work. And um, what I wanted to talk about, too, is just a few concepts in general that we're dealing with. Number one, modern science today, what I say, has literally run out of physical causes for all the effects that we observe. There's just simply not enough material in the universe and different kinds of material to explain all the physical effects that we see. Sure. Um, now, in lieu of or in, in absence of those uh, physical causes, uh, mainstream science has made up imaginary material. They've made up dark matter. They've made up dark energy uh, to try to explain these certain... Uh, aspects of uh, of reality that we see, but we can't, we don't have a physical cause for. So ultimately, what I say is that modern science is in the age of denial. You know, yeah. we had the, you know, we had the age of, uh, of of enlightenment, and we had the space age, and we now have the denial age. And I believe mainstream science is going through a process of coming to a realization that we just simply cannot solve all the physical effects with equally physical causes. And when we run into that, when we get to that point, then the idea or the, the, the thought is open to look beyond the physical, that we may have effects that are be having non-local causes. We certainly have precedent for that on the quantum level. Uh, and there has been, it's kind of almost like a joke that there's been a great effort to try to find macro uh, or relativistic examples of the quantum uh, uh, principle, and yet at the same time being stuck in this materialism uh, where we can't look beyond uh, any of this. Here's um, what I, let me, let me interject one thing while you're hot on this topic. Mm -hmm. Here's where my training in shaman, shamanism is opening my eyes to some things because I believe what science is calling dark energy and dark matter is simply non-ordinary reality. And when I say non-ordinary reality, it is this non-physical reality that's literally occupying time space or space time, but it isn't ordinary reality. It isn't materialism, but it's affecting the mass of the universe. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If we were to 
you know, if I was going to go to a theoretical cosmologist, I could ask, I could pose one question. What is it, what if the singularity from which the Big Bang arose never dissolved? What if that process is still going on? Well, Suddenly, see, we don't have dark energy anymore. No, we don't need it. We no. don't need dark matter anymore. There's, there's, there's two things that I have to put forward in that. One is I've never believed in the Big Bang in the first place. I believe in Big Flow. As such, I believe Big Flow is responsible for our expanding universe because stuff is still flowing in. Now, where does a dark or where does a black hole empty its matter and energy into? We don't see it in our universe. Where's it going? Where's Unless all it, the where's all that stuff that it's eating up? Where is it going? Right, Unless where's the accounting of the balance sheet? Exactly. There has to be something beyond our reality, and this energy is transferring back and forth. We are growing, but yet we are spewing tons and tons and tons and tons of energy and matter out to where we don't know where. Now, well, my question is, is this feeding another bubble or another reality, or is there other realities that are being fed? Are we being fed by another reality? Are these realities non-ordinary realities so that there's nothing physical that we can put our finger on to map them out, and yet they may be literally occupying the same exact spot that we're occupying? It's very possible. And in Tom's theory, Tom's theory hints at that. Yes, it, 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 uh, it certainly gives us a mechanism by which physical reality can be dematerialize in its exactly. literal sense and materialize and materialize this is why as you've said David and I've said too we in physics cannot come up with a theory of everything without reckoning with paranormal phenomena uh, the one thing that I've done a little differently is I've extended that definition to actually call anomalies, anomalous phenomena that we see in mainstream physics, I call that paranormal also, uh, and kind of build that uh, bridge. Uh, but there's two other concepts that we have to deal with, and one of them is the continuous spatial field, essentially what we would call in, uh, uh, you know, oriental philosophy, what they, they, they call form and substance, that we have to deal with information, and we have to deal with the raw material from which everything in reality is built. <clears throat> information is what mostly gets overlooked in all these ideas. Uh, it's almost completely ignored in the paranormal. I've seen it ignored in theoretical physics all the time. Uh, here we have, for example, uh, when we talk about vacuum energy, or what more is commonly called zero-point energy, we have part of this as a result of virtual particles and antiparticles that literally emerge out of the spatial field and disappear almost instantaneously, the collisions of which creates part of that vacuum energy field. And yet we excuse the virtual particles from the conservation laws, claiming that they only exist for such a pre brief, brief period of time that they don't violate these laws. Although paradoxically, they actually create a real energy effect. Um, so the, my point there is, where does the information come from which forms these particles? Exactly. There's got to be a blueprint somewhere. There's, the certainly other thing, a grid. There's certainly a grid of some kind that yeah. is involved in this. Yeah, the other thing is the spatial field. And we know what Einstein taught us is that space is a substantive field. <clears throat> it's not this void nothingness. It can be bent. It can be twisted. <clears throat> it contains the geometry in which everything of physical reality is, is like a fabric that it's embroidered into. Uh, when we look at uh, E 
equals mc squared, you know, the, uh, uh, the equivalency uh, formula. Uh, what it says, it doesn't say that everything is just energy, no more than it says that everything is just mass. There are right. two forms of the same thing. And if you read deeply into Einstein's writings, what he was saying is that everything is the spatial field that everything is made, it arises, all material points, particles, arise from condensations in the spatial field. And so we need to come up with a means by which this spatial field is generated, and I believe is still being generated. Let's face it, if we have an expanding universe, one of the, the problems that physics hasn't addressed yet is where's all the extra space coming from? Exactly. Space is being added into the universe, filling in more and more distance between all recognizable objects. And mainstream physics just says, well, it, it just appears. It, it, it just comes into existence. Uh, if space is a substantive field, it must be being generated by something. There is a continuous, as you said, David, there's a continuous flow of construction of creation into the physical. Yes. Uh, and paranormal phenomena, I believe that we can discover these concepts uh, or, or the principles behind these concepts through the study of the paranormal. And there's it's one way of... It certainly gives us a field to study it in. And that's what's very important because we're having phenomena that matches that description. Yeah, and, and in order for... Just one... We'll add one other thing... What, the reason why Einstein came up with this structure was he was having trouble uh, uh, integrating gravity into his unified field theory. He couldn't express it mathematically in four dimensions. One of the ways, the only ways that it could possibly work was to be able to generate a gravitational field in space without mass. Right. And it was that massless field. How do you generate this? Because you would need to do this to basically prove the principles of the spatial field he was talking about. This is where he came up with this Einstein-Rosen bridge, where it would produce a structure in local space-time that would create a gravitational field and a warping of space-time without any mass associated with it. Exactly. And, and it, see, I have a problem with the standard model. I always have. Because the standard model isn't standard. I mean, there's, there's issues with it. And I think our subjective grooviness on this subject here, uh, to use my uh, co-author's term, uh, our subjective grooviness recognizes this and says there's something more. And the idea of multiple realities that are not visible, and it goes back to, I, I coined this, this theory 10 years ago, and I called it the fundamental frequency theory. And in it, I propose that reality is like a big carrier wave. It's like a big carrier wave from a TV broadcasting tower. And we are on one subcarrier of that wave. And there are many other subcarriers all around us, but they all have different resonances and they're not visible to us. But each of those subcarriers is its own reality. Is it connected to us? In some instances it is. Um, in some instances, something occurs and interference happens. And when interference happens, we have a crossover between one subcarrier and another, and that creates an anomalous condition. Um, and that's just a basic visualization of what it is we're hitting upon here. Uh, it's, it's not so much of a multiverse, it's a complete universe. We are looking at the physical reality that we can experience of a universe that has way more to it than we can experience. Or what I call the omniverse, in which the universe I like is that term. Yeah, I, I like that term, because what we are seeing is we are seeing information emerge from a non-local source. Now, that non-locality has to be close enough or adjacent enough to our reality for it to interact now, it doesn't interact. Well, maybe it does. It doesn't interact on a regular basis, but then maybe it does. It's just not observed because we're not trained to observe it. Um, 
but it's cyclic, which is indicative of something coming and going. You know, a nearness or a an interference or something that is coming and going, and we don't recognize a regular interval to it, but then time may be totally different at the source point. Sure, sure. This is uh, why uh, uh, in certain paranormal investigations where, uh, you know, the current residences are seeing an apparition that sometimes becomes so clear that they can recognize the individual. Uh, and then somebody finds a 100-year-old photograph and the people's jaws drop when they look at it and say that's the same individual. Both the, uh, both the original individual, physical individual of 100 years ago, and the apparition that's appearing today is being materialized from the exact same collection of information. See, I believe we are very close to reconciling our two theories because I'm, succeed- I'm seceding, I'm ceding the fact I can't even talk tonight. I'm seeding the fact that a wormhole is just another phenomena of this larger picture. And it may be that the dynamics of this larger picture is what is literally creating that wormhole. So we have to yeah. we have to look beyond sort of the basic explanation, which I have concentrated on the basic explanation. <clears throat> but the lagging question is, is where is the wormhole coming from? What is the mechanic that's causing the wormhole to form? That's outside of our reality right now. Mm-hmm. And once, so, we, once we can get the possibility accepted that there is another aspect to reality other than the physical, then we can begin to examine the constraints that materialism put on the Einstein-Rosen bridge that it can only bridge two pieces of space-time. Once we conceptually expand our thinking beyond that, we can begin looking at other sources for where this structure might actually emerge. Uh, I absolutely agree. Now, see, now we're getting to the meat of the sandwich. And it took us the entire hour to get here. So, what are you doing two weeks from now on Wednesday night? Uh, If you've got it... <clears throat> on mystical entanglement? And well, this isn't no, mystical it's, entanglement. This no, it's what, the devil's advocate. Oh, uh, the devil's advocate. <laughs> but I mean, if I you're not... remember. I know. Well, then see, you can forgive me for your book title. Uh, so <laughs> here, here's the thing. I like where we're going, and I would like to go further. Again, you know, uh, kind of where we started before but never quite got to. I would like for us to take our line of thought on this, Stephen, what do you think on this, and continue it on into the next show, if that's possible. Stephen, wake up. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I mean, One second, Steve. I, I mean, Stephen went out and he, he looked up a, a paper and he posted the link down in our chat box below us on the actual, on our Skype window. Uh, which refutes some of the standard model, and it brings up a lot of points that you're italicizing here. So I think we should meet again in two weeks. We should maybe do a little digging and see what, like Stephen just did, he's, he's offering evidence supporting of our line of thinking. And these are the tools that we need to boister up our argument, is that there is something wrong and we may have an opportunity to correct that. Yes, and if we do it, if we do it right, the way you're wanting to do it, David, we have a collection of effects that we can observe, measure, study, and analyze that mainstream physics doesn't. And that's the whole point here. Because if we can get mainstream physics to see this, a lot of resources that are much greater than we are can be thrown at this. Mm-hmm. And suddenly we have a discovery. And, and that's the whole point of all this. The point is to find the truth. Um, Stephen, any yes, uh, last words? Uh, no, it's so short on time. I mean, I will mention that I can equally find articles well, you know, about, before about you, before errors. You, before you get all your panties in a crunch, we're not on a solid timeline like we were on the other network. We can run a little over if we want to. Um, Eric 
Eric doesn't get too bent out of shape because I don't think there's a show after us. So, oh, uh, well, we, that, okay, we can go a few minutes over, and that's okay. We're we're not in the doghouse for that. Okay, well, in that case, I looked at um, some of the the Avericks, the general physics letters back and forth, and it seems like the folks who are much better at math than all of us, but I I I tend to understand what they're talking about. Uh, they have found that this Evans ECE character who's got a great theory and has picked up on Einstein's fundamental error, uh, assuming an incorrect geometry of the universe, that he does, he does have his share of errors. So, I mean, it's going to take some parsing. He tends to suppress, I guess, what at first would seem inconsequential. He suppresses... Uh, mismatch indices, uh, these these indice match errors that occur early on in his calculations, he ignores those because right. at the time they're consequential. And some of his critics are saying, well, later on that has a you know, cumulative you, effect. Yes, yes, it has a cumulative effect. But I mean, the guy's on to something. Is the point, you know? Yeah, he is, and he's on to it from a totally different perspective than we have, and that's Correct. important. It's important and because he does well, have. It's not like he's not a published guy. He's got a book. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at it now. It looks like a textbook. It's generally coherent unified field theory. I've never heard a unified field theory with that, uh, you know, subtext before. Generally covariant unified field theory. So anyway, what he's doing is uh, attempting to. Um, Take what is already mainstream physics, go beyond the standard model, the standard model, and really complete the work of Einstein and Cartan. So you know, and these guys sought to unify field theory and physics with the principles of general relativity, and this guy thinks he's on to the first possibility of truly doing that. I mean, it, it's got its errors, but they all do work fudge factors. In fairness, they all do work fudge factors in to their sure. theories, even competing theories to his. That's, that's materialism at work. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's, a, that's a prime example of materialism at work. Yes. And we've got to move away from that being the, the crux of the biscuit because we have already acknowledged that there's something more than materialism. We know there is. We've documented it. We've documented effects of it. And these aren't inconsequential effects. So we've got to look for that explanation, and materialism has to sort of kick over to the left a little bit and let us come through with it. Um, and I think that I think we're on the right track with this expanded omniverse theory because it would certainly allow for the emerging of information, which is what we are seeing. So, well, <laughs> no well, one has well, ever come up with what the non-local part of, of this all is. What is non-locality? Well, <laughs> well non-locality in materialistic terms is it's, it's coming from someplace except for here. It's right. magic. It's magic. It's magic it's a, that, it's you know, enough. electrons <laughs> jump into their higher valences around the... You know, it, the the nucleus by magic. It just appears it, and disappears. It, it is the feathery realms of physics. <laughs> I like that. I like oh, that. Oh, yeah. But <laughs> it doesn't, the point is it doesn't have to be because all of this stuff we're calling, uh, well, whatever you name it, the stuff we're calling feathery realms, jokingly, woo-woo, disparagingly, the stuff <laughs> we're calling non-locality, technically, all of it could just be epiphenomenological to a phenomenon we don't understand. So this is really what, what has to be done is we have to understand more about the fundamental physics of the universe, explore deeper this business of the dark flow, which people still underestimate. I don't know where they've been, David, but all of that, that needs to be explored. It, it blows me away. Do you, do you remember we first, we first really started we, talking on a regular... We uh, thought that routine. was a huge, a huge discovery, and these people are poo-pooing it. We've got emerging material. Yeah, there are unknown a, structures tugging at the human. A vast amount, yeah, a vast amount of, we've got bruising on the micro, cosmic microwave background. 
Well, let's We've put got... it in terms uh, the egghead's going to understand. There is extra universal matter with extreme mass tugging at our universe. This kind of, that should give anyone a clue that there's something going on way beyond the standard model. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and the concept of it being a carrier with us within that carrier is a good visualization of that process. Sure it is. And that's the only reason that I use it, because if every reality had a different resonance, all those realities could literally occupy the same space and rarely interfere with one another. We do it with radio waves, so we know it's possible. It's not a pipe dream or some fantasy. We're doing it. We're doing it with radio broadcasts, and we have been doing it for over 100 years. So we're not talking about magic or woo-woo. We're talking about a known principle. And, and we, we can't explain aspects of that known principle even to this day. I mean, FM is fucking magic. I mean, that's all there is to it. So, oh, yeah. so, you know, no one can explain FM field propagation. I mean, it's just, it's FM. It's fucking magic. That's how I was taught in college. It's fucking magic. That's what the professor said. FM stands for fucking magic. And it's the inverse square law. Yeah. <laughs> Which so, is magic too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's magic built upon magic built upon magic. We need to peel away the magic and find out what's going on there. And this is the, I think, is the, the light bulb in the dark closet. <clears throat> and we're pulling that string right now. So, and, and I think uh, that uh, one of the the things that I want to promote is that we have to begin with some sort of a fundamental paradigm, some sort of what I call the capstone of the pyramid. Yes, the pyramid has two million stones. We're talking about various stones right now within that pyramid. But we have to identify the capstone. And for me, that capstone is that the universe is an expression of materialized and materializing information. And I think that's the fundamental set of glasses that we need to put on to look through from that position to all these other perspectives. And I think that's the concept that ultimately is going to give us that common thread to tie everything together. I agree. And with that being said, thanks for coming on the show tonight, Tom. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. I mean, I oh, think- oh, good, good. And let me give a let me give a quick preview for the folks who might be interested in this ECE business and how we how we yeah, might tie it all together. The um, uh, a few things I found interesting. I, I, I did just, by the way, I just happened to be looking at ECE theory for the past two months, not knowing Tom would be coming on. It just kind of came across my radar, and I kept looking into it, finding interest in it. Well, there's, uh, no, there's no such thing as coincidence in our world. No, no. Well, I, I, I would believe you saying that, but uh, unfortunately, George Norrie says that too, so I'm not sure. The, well, uh, I'm saying it from a much more authoritative standpoint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 I know. Uh, I'm, let me look at my notes real quick. So here's what I found from the papers, what I believe I found is uh, he achieves unif- unification with the principles of standard Cartan geometry uh, and some of the Evans work. The, the latter of that showed that electromagnetism is spinning space-time, gravitation is curving space-time, and that they are unified with the structure he proposes, he keeps calling it master equations of Cartan. So he refers back to Cartan uh, for his fundamental geometric assumptions about the universe, which he says fills a hole in Einstein's thinking, if only these two had gotten on the same page. And, interesting, what, what he says, quantum mechanics, he proposes, is ultimately unified with general relativity using the Evans lemma, or lemma, depends which school you went to, and wave equation, both things we've all learned and heard about. Uh, so it's not like he's, he's not making up fairy dust. And... He's even got some technical appendices. He's got charts uh, in which he fleshes it all out. He shows how 
all the major equations of physics are obtained really through ECE field theory the same way they can be through their systems, but with fewer and more elegant math. So, so it's a step in the right direction, but it's not oh yeah. a destination. Yeah, so the, the mathematical structure of this guy's theory is standard Cartan geometry that uh, when I went to school, they called it differential geometry. Right. So it's not, yeah. it shouldn't be anything incredibly new to folks, but it is something that he uses in a new way. He, he tends to describe the conditions under his theory as um, reducing the Einstein-Hilbert theory and the Maxwell-Heaviside field theory in classical electrodynamics down to, down to the conflicts between the Dirac equation and the limits of wave equation theory. So he, he works it all out. He finds a flaw also, and you'd be interested in this, David. Um, he finds that the Schrodinger and Newton equations, um, those follow as limits of the Dirac equation, which I've never heard anyone, anyone propose that you could use Schrodinger and Newton's equations to elicit a new limit in the Dirac equations. Well, if so, in other words, if you can rectify Schrodinger, Newton, and Dirac, and then find a correct underlying geometry of the universe, then you might be able to create a grand unified theory, or what he calls a generally covariant unified field theory. Now, if we could get him to adopt super geometry right. into its mathematical functions. Oh, no. I think yeah. we would have the pecan pie. The one thing that I believe, based on what I understand or what I, what I think is going on conceptually, is that uh, wave function formulas, which are used to calculate the probable outcome of a, of a quantum state, represent something real. They're not just mathematical abstracts uh, that are just used as a kind of a, you know, like a cheat sheet to figure out, a, a, you know, the result of a formula. I believe they represent something real. They don't represent something physical, but they represent something That's quite correct. real. And, and they are real. And here's where we come to this super physical condition or this non-ordinary reality that I like to call it, <clears throat> is that we're creating that reality. We're predicting the creation of that reality, and then it becomes real. What mainstream physicists don't get from quantum mechanics, or what they don't get from quantum physicists, is that process of, of uh, potential or probability becoming reality. That, that, that's the interface and yeah, that's because where, that's where Einstein lost it and said, "Oh, you know, it's it's just it's spooky shit." Well, you know? he also said that there, you know, he un, he he respected the merits of it, but he believed that there was something, some deeper truth underlying it. That quantum well, physics was not precisely what it looked like on its surface. And I believe he's correct. Quantum mechanics, to me, is the interface. It's the interface between non-ordinary reality and reality. Right. It it's is the manifestation. Reality. Yeah. It's the it is, we might call it what I might say. Here we have uh, no relativity. It's completely non-physical. And then we have a transitional state, which is quasi-physical or semi-physical, where um, uncertainty is at the heart of quantum, uh, the quantum state. Because material or, or reality, physical reality, has not fully materialized or unfolded from it yet. Right. And the missing ingredient, again, which we have to put in the equation to solve the puzzle, is the fundamental paradigm of materialized and materializing information. Because that's the only thing that makes this quasi-uncertain state unfold 
into a very solid and predictable state of relativity. It's the information that's shaping that transitional state into fully materialized reality. Without that concept of information, it's just, you know, here's crazy and here's normal. Mm. So, you know, and, you know, we have no explanation for crazy. It's just crazy. That's just the way it is. And we have no explanation why it turns into normalcy. It just does, you know, uh, uh, and that's it. You know, let's go have dinner. Well, it turns into it turns into normalcy when the occurrence of events is such that it's no longer perinormal or paranormal. It's become an approximation of normal over time to become normal. That's how that works. But you know, we're in we're in the kind of universe where everything is still based on you know the natural philosophical sciences and so really what you were mentioning earlier about these uh these probabilities being related to something real i mean yeah i mean that would that would that would make sense i mean uh they if they're probabilities of events or probabilities of information it makes sense that they would be probabilities of something real <laughs> Yeah, and I don't believe that, uh, uh, I think the formula is the math that says that anything superluminal begins to move backwards in time. I believe that that mathematics is flawed. There's something wrong. Well, you, yeah, see, now we're, we're back to this important ECE theory tie-in, or at least what he has to offer. The only way the math on that could be wrong is if some fundamental assumption like the, geomet the geometric substrate, the, that geometric assumption on which the universe is based is incorrect. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Eureka, Eureka, Eureka. Yes. Hence, supergeometry. And there is unfortunately... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. There, is, there is something beyond that fundamental geometry. And we have to recognize that fact because... It, it is. It's all. It's we see, we encounter it in just about everything we do in physics. That there's just something beyond our grasp. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When we and get down to the final fundamental aspects, the meat and potatoes of it, we get to a point where we can't go further, and that's where materialism ends, and supergeometry begins. Right. And the advantage that that we have with paranormal research is. If we are to accept the premise that in the quantum state we're looking at reality, in the physical reality, in the process of materializing, all the information that we see is basically the geometry and the structure and the nature of these, these subatomic functions of, of you know, energy and, and particles. When we get into the macro universe of relativity, we actually see a whole collection of information that materializes for which there is absolutely no evidence for in the quantum level. But, However, but, but we are seeing repetitive patterns from the mm -hmm. micro to the macro. Yeah. We are seeing repetitive geometry from the micro to the macro. So there is something non-local creating that unified geometry. And in paranormal phenomena, we have the opportunity to actually see that set of information that we normally only see in a fully materialized state in relativity. We actually see that extra set of information materializing in real time, local to us in our proximity and on a human scale, and also in a predictable way because there are certain sites that are active. Uh, that we can actually study something that we can't do in mainstream physics. And we can predict the data that's going to emerge. Yes, yes. And that gives it a foundation. Because when we can predict that data, we're predicting potential reality. Yeah. It's that simple. It's that simple. And this is why science will not look at this because it's woo-woo to them. 
It's, well, yeah. It's non-material. You have something that you can't measure or observe. That's quite frightening. Yet. Yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, right. Until we have a dark flow detector or something, and then it's yeah, like, oh, exactly. Yo, well, here's got, how. Right, here's how it's done. We've got ghost detectors, right? Yeah, <laughs> the screen it pops up a little blinky light, and it says ghost. You know. Yeah, my phone is saying uh, whoop whoop whoop. Yeah, so yeah. the K two meter. Yeah. Yeah, I'm talking to a moving light. It's fine. You know, David, I was about to bring something up earlier because it. I hearken back to some of our old notes. Do you remember when the end of the second iteration of the podcast bygone, when at the very end there we were doing like uh, years in review and we were looking back at, hey, what was my take on this in 2004? Yes. Right, yes. okay. Right, so when I got to 2008, I found some of my notes on a discussion we had. And again, this is when we had just barely begun to speak in any right. routine manner. Uh, and we were both talking about the October 20 issue of Astrophysical Journal Letters. Mm-hmm. And I was writing things like, this theory will rewrite the laws of physics. Uh, current models say the known or visible universe, which far extends, uh, or which extends as far as light, could have traveled since the Big Bang, is essentially the same as the rest of space-time. Uh, I was saying all these things thinking, this dark flow thing, man, it's going to blow it all out of the water. This dark flow thing is going to change everything. And here, there's been nothing. I mean, this Absolutely. dark flow business, for people who for people who need to know what this means, I'll give you an example of why this should have been picked up by science. And there's every reason to think that this uh, secret space program conspiracy uh, may may have a, a public perception arm that handles and frankly rabbit holes things like this there is a phenomenon in physics about background radiation that was driving the physicists crazy it was about cluster velocity okay mm-hmm. and it basically asked the question hey these clusters uh, of galaxies when compared against the backgrounds uh, which, which in which they are set, uh, there should be some theory we can, some observable theory we can confirm, like clusters closer to us appear to be moving more quickly, and clusters further away from us appear to be moving more slowly. I mean, there'd be a whole mathematical construct to that but i'm really boiling it down well along the way in discovering dark flow through the wilkinson microwave anastropy probe that w map probe which nasa right launched along the way they found check this out the researchers had expected to find that the farther the clusters are away the slower they appeared to be moving. Instead, they discovered the clusters are all moving at the same speed. Isn't nearly, that fascinating? Yeah, nearly 2 million miles an hour. And, check this, dark flow, in a single direction. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and it's that huge. Would, that would be uh, consistent with the concept that Physical reality is a continuously emerging phenomenon. Exactly. Yeah? Yes. Exactly. There's the proof in the pudding right there, and they're all looking the other way and crying wolf. Well, one, there's one other aspect to this. If you talk about a coherent collection of information that to what we can observe on our own Earth must contain some sort of intelligence... Otherwise, there would be nothing our intelligence could emerge from that existed prior to the physical universe. I mean, all the atheists are burning us at the stake there. Oh, yeah. You know, because you're, that smacks of God. Well, it, it, whatever you want to call it, something is providing order out of chaos. And no one order. has, yeah, implicate order. I mean, not even, it's impl- intricate order. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. 
and and in great detail, building or, blocks, massive holy geometry. I mean, yeah, or what God, the, you can what call the, it whatever you want. Yeah, uh, Bolt called it explicate order. Yeah, e- e- uh-huh. either way, I mean, we are seeing a manifestation of something beyond us. And to con- continue to say there's nothing to that, is nothing to that, that's anecdotal, that's this, that's that, is burying your head in the sand and saying, you know, it'll go away. It's not going to go away. Uh, it- it's, the creating, it's the creating force of our reality. Now, I think we're on our way to defining that. And if we do, that's huge. Yes. And no someone doubt. with much better credentials than we have will probably take credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we not, just, if, you know, not if you get the paper out early enough. What I propose is that we all pitch in on this paper. Uh, I, I, I've got a part-time job in technical writing. We can make sure... We can make sure it communicates the correct things in the correct way to the correct audience. I suggest you get David to co-author this thing. Uh, and in an editorial role, you'll have three minds going in on this paper. Just make sure that gets done right. And it'll be on record for all time uh, who said what when as to the contributing factors of the new physics. Yeah, I mean, we need to write an introductory paper before we even start reproducing the experiments. Because... That the experiments, it would be good to show the initial theory and then demonstrate the alteration of the theory based on experimental data. Yes. Or the confirmation of the, de- of the theory. Mm-hmm. Um, both of which are essential to saying, hey, there's something to this. So uh, I agree. I mean, Tom and I have been kicking it around for a while. You know, good, I'm, good. I'm in this time thing where I have no time. Yeah, me either, but this would be worth taking the time. Yeah, I agree. Dave, David, you're in a temporal singularity, man. <laughs> no, there's, there's no such thing as a fucking singularity, Tom, because I have many of these temporal things. Uh, they're certainly not singular in any way, shape, fashion, or form. They, they tend to be a clusterfuck on me at, at all times, and they gang up. So, um, One of the things we are going to have to do at some point, and, and David, you and I have talked about this before, uh, once we get enough substance together to form some sort of a coherent pattern of thought, we got to find ourselves the right mathematician. We really need to find a mathematician because th- this stuff borders on new math. You know, we need a theoretical mathematician is what we need. Yeah. Well, I wonder, I wonder if we could rope Evans into this. I mean, he's been marginalized. I wonder if he would feel like, you know what, this kind of thinking is just beyond the standard model so much, I've got to get involved. Or he may feel like we're the, uh, you know, we're, we're inviting pariahs or something. I don't know. Well, we may fall flat on our face, too. I mean, yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's a crapshoot at this point. Um, although I think we have a pretty strong fundamental foundation to go on. Yeah, I do, too. Uh, sure. And, I, and, and I'm confident enough that we will prove something. We may not prove what we want to prove, but this process will cause us to prove something. And it will be yes. something that is heretofore unheard of. So uh, in that aspect, it's, it's blazing a trail and, and it's a worthy cause. Because even if we fall on our face, we're going to change the way people think about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, to me, it's, it's a worthwhile gamble, you know. So, but anyway, um, we've really worn out our welcome at this point. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, Eric's probably over there going, I want to go to bed, get these assholes off my, uh, my show here. Uh, but uh, I want to thank everybody for listening in. Tonight's episode was brought to you by Clay Smith, whose book, uh, All You Know is What You Think You Know. And that's kind of where we were at tonight. So thank you, Clay, for the inspiration for tonight's show. Uh, Clay will be, uh, he is supporting the next, I believe, three or four shows in, a, in, you know, in conjunction with the two that he has already supported. And uh, we welcome anyone else who would like to uh, contribute to our cause and help us pay for broadcasting costs to uh, give us something to advertise. And we'll hawk your book, your show, your 
your uh, shoe size, whatever you want us to hawk for five dollars an episode. You can't get those rates anywhere. So, uh, good night, everybody. Thanks, Stephen, for being here tonight. Thanks, thank you, Tom, and we're looking forward to your return in two weeks so we can pick up where we've left off. All right. Thanks for having me. And uh, uh, and you and I are going to get together sometime before then with uh, with our friend there. Yeah, absolutely, and we may have some more grist from the mill from that conversation. Mm -hmm. So thanks for joining us tonight, everybody. Good night, and we will see you in two weeks. Good night.